I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Welcome everyone to VLGA Connect. It's the TGU panel together again to talk about this week's big local government news. And there's been few weeks bigger than this one. Hello, Tony Rannick. Absolutely, Chris. What a week uh, full of announcements and implications mm-hmm. for the sector. And hello, Julie Reid. Hello, Chris. Yes, I'm feeling it this week. Lots of reading, lots of digesting. Wow. Yes, I, can, can I can I perhaps uh, guess that you've been reading a three hundred and I think a three hundred and nine page report that finally came out from IBAC this week into Operation Sandon. Now, for those who uh, perhaps uh, aren't aware, can't imagine you're not. Uh, this is the outcome of what's been a few years now of uh, inquiries and processes related to the city of Casey and various planning matters. The outcome is not just going to affect the city of Casey, it's going to affect the whole sector. Now, can I just say up front that we're going to unpack this in uh, in great detail on a special edition of VLGA Connect that's coming next week. The heavy hitters are coming in for this one. I'm talking about Catherine Arndt, the CEO of the VLGA, and uh, Tony Rownick will put a legal uh, lens on this. But uh, Tony and Julie, just in broad terms, perhaps if we can talk about your initial reactions, Julie, I might start with you as the planner mm-hmm. in the group. What were your thoughts? Yes, Chris. I mean, obviously, there were really strong governance and planning recommendations. Uh, it's interesting that um, my initial thoughts were not surprised, not surprised at the recommendations that came through around planning and expected that it was going to end up in this space. What we're going to see now is this um, pulling away of powers from local government in the planning space as a result. So this is this is really significant for the sector. Mm. And I'm sure that councils around the state are um, looking at the the document really in a lot of detail at the moment to understand what that's going to mean for them. But look, it was interesting this week, the Planning Institute of Australia put out a communication through to all the members of PIA. Um, They have supported the government, um, sorry, supported the recommendations to the government Um, and they do believe that the government should consider um, ways to capture the windfall gains and welcomes the emphasis on strategic justification in planning. You must have reasons why you want to rezone land. So that was really good. They have made a really, really strong statement about the importance of the fact that in all of this, the staff have done a job that they should have done They've been, you know, they've made recommendations that uh, Mm. were valid um, and they shouldn't really be um, criticised in this situation for um, what has gone on. Um, So they're urging the Victorian government to work closely with the Planning Institute um, and to design and implement the planning reforms from the report in consultation with the sector. Um, and with the planners. So, um, you know, really, really strong message coming out from from the Planning Institute of Australia. And rightly so, uh, the staff in all of this um, have done the job they should have done. Good to get that perspective on it up front. I do note, uh, as you hinted, the Premier, uh, his response pretty measured so far, but he has said there's a clear position of the government that the role of local councils in significant planning decisions should be reduced, and they'll have more to say on that. I think, Tony, uh, interested in your take on that, of course, but also quite a few governance things wrapped up in these recommendations that perhaps we weren't expecting? Exactly, Chris. That That's sort of a big takeaway for me. The um, we, we sort of anticipated these, these planning changes, which will, of course, have an enormous impact on the role of council and its operations, but equally so, I think some of the governance changes in those 34 recommendations, if picked up, for example, you know, the requirement for model transparency rules, which deal with, you know, pre-council meetings, um, how what mm-hmm. what's allowed um, in terms of discussions at council briefings. Um, how do we run uh, council meetings? Are there with you know in terms of having standard governance rules? Um, this 
no need for divisions because we're going to record everyone's vote um, um, for every resolution. Um, the, the change to the misconduct sanctions such that potentially you, know, you might be a councillor who's found guilty of misconduct might be ineligible to be the mayor. Um, mm. The changes around um, CEO contracts, having a model CEO contract, a standard contract, and essentially taking um, the uh, appointment, performance, review, management and monitoring um, obligation or, or, you know, responsibility away from councillors in that a majority of people on that committee, including the chair, would be independent. And I think that's um, that's, big. that's a major change it's, in it's terms big. of how the administration operates and, and council's role um, in, 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 you know, being able to affect organisational change, but also, you know, um, in, in terms of continuity. So there's a lot here still to play out and um, the detail will be really important. And that's where the task force that the, that's in the recommendation, recommendation number one, in fact, um, the task force, if, um, if, if set up, will have an enormous role in, um, in, in getting into the detail of these recommendations. So th there's a lot to unpack there. And as I said, we will do that on a special episode, uh, hopefully very early next week. Those that you mentioned, the briefing session implications, the CEO employment life cycle implications uh, are major, and perhaps we weren't expecting those. Uh, LG Pro has come out and uh, welcomed many of the recommendations. Some of these align with comments that LG Pro has made in its submission to the culture review. Um, they've particularly highlighted sanctions for misconduct that are adequate and applied appropriately, explicit provisions for uh, allowing council officers and members of the public to make complaints to the chief municipal inspector and publication of data on arbitration and complaint processes. As we said, there's so much in this. Um, I, 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 we might park it there, but I just did want to make one comment and get yeah, your thoughts. Yeah, just one thought. other comment from me yeah, as well, Chris. Yeah, Sorry. Please, just, you go first, Julie. Yeah, just I just wanted to make the point uh, broadly that, you know, any changes to the Victorian planning system must put the interests of the public first um, and should there should be clear mechanisms for local input to planning decisions. So we can't lose sight of that. And I think it's, it's, it's really clear um, in all of this, if power is taken away, that there still needs to be that local local input. That's what I'm concerned about. Um, and I think that the Planning Institute of Australia are concerned about that as well, because planning um, fundamentally um, is committed to public interest as well. Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure we'll hear that uh, talked about quite a bit as these uh, recommendations get discussed. Um, Tony, Julie, one of the things that occurred to me in reading through all of this is we've got a reasonably new piece of legislation, the Local Government Act 2020, which was meant to be and was trumpeted as being principles-based and not prescriptive as per the old Act. Are we, if all of these get implemented, actually going back to a piece of legislation that is more prescriptive than principles-based? A hundred percent. I think the pendulum is clearly sw swinging towards prescription, swinging towards um, uh, swinging away from the idea that um, councils might take an individual approach, um, have have different um, policies, different provisions in terms of how meetings are run, in terms of governance rules, transparency rules, councillor codes of conduct. Um, we're going to have a standardisation, it would seem across the 79 councils. Chris, and I think there will be certainly some concern and maybe some resistance from those that drafted the legislation in the first place to mm. move into this space. But, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see what this task force uh, within the government comes up with because they, at the end of the day, they may not have much choice in this space. No. They may have to go for more prescription. And, and, and I just would just make the point, if I, yeah. Chris, is it, it's, it's these are just recommendations. So yes. um, we, the, the, it's for the government to pick up on these. And already, uh, you know, the, the message I'm hearing is they're not going to pick up on those political donations recommendations. Is is the sense I've got in terms of what 
the Premier has said yesterday, saying, you know, Victoria's already got that covered. Um, so we may see some walking back by government with some of these recommendations at least. And I would make the point that most of the behaviours that are unpacked in this report occurred before the new Local Government Act ever actually came into effect. So let's keep that in perspective as well. Mm. All right. Uh, promise to come back to that on our special episode next week. And I'm sure Catherine, the CEO of the VLGA, will have uh, a take on all of that as well. Um, lots of other things happening this week. Another long running matter has reached uh, one point of conclusion. That is the uh, the case of iCook Foods versus Greater, Greater Dandenong City Council. Um, it's been referred to, and I hate it, the term as as sluggate for, for quite some time. Um, the matter between the council and I Cook Foods is now concluded. The case was dropped after a court ordered mediation, which uh, I'm sure has been welcomed within the Greater Dandenong City Council. Big effects on staff here over a long period of time. Tony, your take? Yeah, as you say, um, the outcome of that mediation held on the 25th of July was that um, a settlement, both parties are bearing their own legal costs. There's no payment um, from De Greater Dandenong City Council to iCook um, Proprietary Limited, um, according to the statement on um, Dandenong's website. So I guess this would be heartening for those council officers, um, both current and former, that were, you know, um, part of the... Um, the, the allegations or, or the material that was put forward by iCook Foods in that mm. it would seem at least in relation to these proceedings, um, the outcome is that uh, there's, you know, not, not only nothing adverse and, and uh, no, no compensation or payment by council um, would seem the council has been vindicated through this set of proceedings at least. That's certainly the tone of the statement that's come from the CEO, Jackie Weatherall, of course, who's come into the role partway through uh, all of this. Uh, it would just make the point that uh, this whole matter is not completely uh, finished. There is a, a court action, I think, that's happening next week. And Professor Brett Sutton, the former chief uh, health officer, is, I think, the only witness in that matter. So insiders tell me that that's perhaps not going to take a long time to play out as well. So the next piece of the puzzle, uh, we'll know how that looks like fitting in soon. Chris, I think it's really great to see this coming to a, a closure. Um, there's a lot of people at Greater Dandenong that have uh, enormous amounts of integrity and have gone through enormous amounts of stress during this time on this case. Um, and it's really great to see the outcome today uh, that um, that has really gone in favour of the city of Greater Dandenong. It will be interesting to see what comes out next week, but um, very pleased to see, uh, we'll be very pleased to see the back of this one. All right. Uh, Tony, we recently talked about an arbiter's report at Golden Plains involving Councillor Les Rowe. There's been a second one, and this one sort of upped the ante a bit because uh, Councillor Rowe is now on a one-month suspension, and I note has, has requested and been granted a leave of absence that backs on to that, so he'll be away from council now until October. So this was over a different matter than the previous one we discussed. Yeah, that's right. So previously we, we discussed comments in relation to uh, directed towards a CEO in an email that was CC'd to all councillors um, that were, were regarded as misconduct or inappropriate comments towards the CEO that the, the councillor tried to explain away as his blunt farmer manner. Um, well, in this case, um, the, we're, we're dealing with comments the same councillor, Councillor Les Rowe, made to a reporter, the Golden Plains Times is a publication, and the comments were critical of Council's road grading program, um, and they were reported in an article in January in that, in that newspaper. And various staff in the Council's um, grading and um, outdoors team were quite upset by these comments, some of them visibly upset. And um, Mr. Rowe, Councillor Rowe had refused to apologise. It said, you know, I didn't intend to criticise staff. That wasn't my um, intent, so I'm not going to apologise, which the arbiter, someone well known in local government circles, Yehudi Blasher, mm. um, he said, well, that's a curious argument. It's not just what you intend. It's the reasonable effect of your words. Um, mm. Interestingly, Councillor Rowe had not passed on 
what he said were complaints from members of the public about the road grading program. He hadn't passed them on to the council administration, council officers. And um, the arbiter found that um, it was misconduct, that an apology was required to be made in writing. The apology needed to acknowledge the, um, the, the, the relevant council staff were upset, were insulted, felt left down. And, and more than that, Councillor Rowe has had to undertake that in future, any operational matters that were brought to his attention would be passed on to the CEO or to relevant staff. So, and not know, via the media. And not via the media. <laughs> yeah. There's a second element to this decision I can just say that I think is um, important and will have CEOs sort of rushing to their policies and looking, mm. and that is an element of the allegation that wasn't upheld was that it was that that there was a breach of the council's media policy and the media policy said that media comments should and should's the critical word here should mm. be coordinated through the senior communications marketing officer and the use of the word should rather than must was seen as you know, material by the arbiter and said, well, it wasn't mandatory because it, um, the word should rather than must was used. So for, for you know, off, uh, CEOs, councillors who, who think that their policies ought to be mandatory, they'll be going to those policies and looking to see, do they use language like should or do they yeah, use um, um, more um, directive type language like must? And and Tony, did I did I read correctly that there, there was an intention that it would be a, a, a must or something that's more definitive, but that that change hadn't been formally incorporated into the policy. I, I didn't pick that up. It may well be, but uh, if that's the case, well, even even more sort of underlines the need for um, us in the sector, but to yeah. be you know going through these policies and and making sure the correct language is used. Yeah, look, Chris, um, interesting and I think a really good decision by uh, Yehudi Blasher in this case. Um, it was interesting to see that extra bit of um, sort of uh, not getting involved in the operations. I was really pleased to see that. Um, my question to Tony would be if that gets breached at any one time or any time, you know, what will then happen? Does that then mean that they're breaching the um the arbiters um direction and what action can then be taken against the councillor in relation to that so that's really interesting from that point of view and probably the first case i think we've seen that it's had that kind of a direction around the op uh, you know getting involved in the operations is that correct tony yeah well, well i think what what i found really interesting along, along those terms was that in this arbiter decision, the arbiter actually reflected on the prior arbiter decision by Louise Hill. So the, if you like, there was that element of, you know, there's a cumulative impact here. Um, this is the second occasion where you double down and refuse to apologise. Um, clearly, um, I need to make sure that um, it's more than just an apology. I need to be more directive in terms of um, what you undertake to do. I think in terms of um, failure to um, follow the arbiter's determination, um, the determination was that you need to make an apology and you need to make this undertaking. So given that that's been done and that I've seen it um, in, the, in the tabled decision, the council minutes, a handwritten letter mm -hmm. from, from, councillor, uh, from the councillor, um, to the to the staff in question, arguably he's gone ahead and 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 done what he was required to do, but I think it's it does mean um, councillors who who have form, if I can put it that colloquially, um, that is seems to be being taken into account at, at the time an arbiter's decision was made. There's a context that's um, being considered. So um, I don't want to labour this too much and certainly <clears throat> don't want to present a case for the prosecution here, Tony, but the arbiter said uh, that the written apology must be limited to the following and provided a couple of dot points. The written apology, handwritten as you say, goes further than that. And there's some qualifying comments in there that made me wonder, 
has this written apology actually complied with the arbiter's decision? That or occurred to me. It's the, certainly when the, the, the written apology um, had paragraphs that went to, you know, what I'll continue to do as a counsellor and what, you know, what, what I've done in the past and which were sort of extraneous, if you like, or, or, or certainly mm. weren't part of the, the arbiter's um, order or, or determination. So um, it'll be interesting what attitude yeah. perhaps that um, the Councillor Conduct Panel Registrar takes to that. All right, uh, let's leave that one there. Interesting reading, though, if you like to follow these cases, as I know many of you do. And these are instructive for councillors and for mm. CEOs and officers right across uh, the sector, aren't they? We we talk about these not to embarrass anyone or, you know, um, uh, create a, a, a problem for anyone, but certainly as a learning uh, opportunity, I think, uh, more broadly. Um, another councillor resignation this week at Strathbogie Shire. This is the third one in this term of the council. And we remind you, this is the council that has a second monitor in place as we speak with a term due to expire, I think, next month. Uh, this one's from Seven Creeks Ward. Uh, Christy Hurrigan has uh, stepped down. The interesting thing here, Tony, is the statement that the former councillor has made calling out gender bias and in-house political bureaucracy as clearly being the motivating factor in stepping aside. Yeah, I did see that. Um, look, of course, people make all sorts of statements when they leave an organisation, um, often or you know, well, sometimes critical of the place that they're leaving. And um, I don't know the, the facts that apply here. As you say, there's a monitor at Strathbogie. So presumably um, in the next uh, round of monitor report might well reflect on the situation there and what, what um, the monitor's observations are. But, um, you know, lightning doesn't often strike in the same spot. It's struck three times in mm. Strathbogie. I'm not um, saying that... that uh, that determines an outcome, but but clearly um, uh, three councillors have, have 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 decided that um, it wasn't right for them to stay on as councillors and have, have uh, departed. Yeah. So and so no word yet on a on a process to fill that position. But Julie, before you ask, yeah. forty seven. Forty seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, Chris, if I can just make a comment, what really kind of. Um, worried me about the statement that was made by um, Miss Hurrigan was that she said that the role of the councillor is a thankless task, which mm. is, is, is worrying in that respect that people are seeing it in that way. Um, and what does that mean? What's going on in that community that means that, you know, she feels that she can no longer you know, act in that role. But yeah, because you're right. She 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 yeah. made the point not just in within the council, but beyond as well. The inference That's being right. the community. Yeah, and then she also talks about she's hoping that the council will create this respectful and inclusive environment. You know, mm. and that that worries me. She wants all voices to be heard and to address you know, concerns. So um, so there are obviously some issues there. No doubt that's going to come through in the monitors reporting back to the minister. But what does this mean for Strathbogie going forward? Yeah. You know, there's obviously some issues there that need to be ironed out. And I suspect the government are looking at this very carefully at the moment. I'm sure they would. Three uh, is, is a lot in one term. And with just a little over 12 months to go, uh, till the next election, I guess there's some um, a lot of factors that will need to be taken into account in terms of what response, if any, uh, might be coming. Uh, okay, that's Strathbogie. Down to Surf Coast Shire, it's been getting a bit of attention this week for a decision to amend its community amenity local law, which effectively means that all Shire bathrooms uh, will be gender neutral from this point on. Tony, are we aware of this hap happening in a regional area as yet, or is this a first? Do you think we'd all be familiar, of course, with like unisex toilets, which are yeah. which are so signed as unisex? Mm -hmm. um, what we're actually talking about here, if I understand it right, is no change to the signage. So we'd still see that you know the typically the mm -hmm. women's toilets, the the men's toilets is often the, what the sign says or the image projects, but anyone over the age of six is entitled to use whichever bathroom they choose. So effectively I could use a bathroom um, 
that that was labelled women's or had had the you know the picture of a female on the outside. Um, do you think? I think there's some, you know, I think there's major, some major safety issues here. I haven't read, I must admit, I haven't read the officer's report, but, um, yeah, I, I mm. think not all people in society, uh, you know, you know people in society might take some advantage of this. I've got a few reservations, I've got to say. And, and the, it was those sort of issues, I think, that led to quite a number of submissions against the proposal and a petition, mm. if I recall correctly, that might have had 500 signatures or more. Uh, so the council's weighed all of that up uh, in making its decision and landed on removing that clause from um, the local law. Um, an emotive issue, Julie, uh, for yeah. some. Yeah, it is, Chris. And, you know, I've seen these kind of debates uh, play out in council chambers and, um, you know, female views versus male views on this um, are sometimes very, very different. Mm. Um, so, look, I think I think this is this is certainly interesting in terms of them having the courage to try this and see how it goes. Um, they've obviously been under a lot of criticism around it, and I would have expected that. I don't know whether or not our communities are ready for this yet. Um, but anyway, look, mm. I, I think hats off to them. I think it's great that they're trying something different. Um, I I think it's um, I think it's a really a really good test of how the community going forward will accept this kind of um, approach towards you know delivery of services by councils. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, Surf Coast Shire. More generally, we talked to Tony uh, with the cancellation of the regional Victorian Commonwealth Games. Um, those councils that perhaps weren't in the regional hubs but had made commitments based on the expected outcomes of the games. Um, I'm not saying it's because we raised it here, but certainly there's news now of a compensation package for councils that goes uh, to the regional hubs, but a little bit beyond as well. Yeah, two million for those um, other councils that are beyond those regional hubs, five million each for La Trobe, um, Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, and another three million for Shepparton. So, and this is to cover those um, those costs of you know the resourcing up that occurred um, at those places, particularly the hub hub councils where yes, there were senior officer appointments um, in rightly so in relation to preparing for um, the Commonwealth Games, and those officers are still employed. They're on employment contracts. They are um, there are obligations to pay them, and they're presumably being redeployed maybe in um, some of the expenditure of this money and, and making decisions mm. about, um, you know, the capital works uh, programs that were to be associated with um, with the Commonwealth Games. So, look, I think this is a, a good, um, a something we'd hail from the government, we'd thank them for, and um, um, I'm sure that those regional um, councils um, will we'll, we'll welcome very much. And hopefully it, it makes a, a significant difference in those non-hub communities. I'm not sure mm. how far the two million will go. And I guess we'll, we'll, we'll hear about that over time. So this was reported in The Age this week. I haven't seen too much more on it, but the, 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 the slant of that story was very much about uh, picking up the costs of senior executive roles that have been created expressly for the purpose of delivering the games on behalf of those councils. Um, because, uh, Julie, some of those were like four or five year contracts, weren't they? So, um, A, it's good to know that uh, the ratepayers aren't bearing the cost of that uh, cancellation in that sense, but also those councils have a resource now to redeploy in some way, which would make perhaps for some interesting conversations with those individuals. Exactly, yes, and um, I was really pleased to see this, and I think it will help those councils that uh, obviously have, um, you know, challenges around financial sustainability going forward. So, uh, yeah, look, it's it's it. Hopefully now they can they can use those people to help deliver other critical services that need to be delivered across across the council area. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple of stories from interstate. A couple of extraordinary stories that have come out this week. I want to start with in Tasmania, where a Dorset Council has been subject of an investigation by the director of local government. I, I assume that's the 
equivalent of an LGV or a chief municipal inspector or something like that uh, here in Victoria. Um, it's found allegations of syst systematic and widespread statutory non-compliance and failings of good governance. This has led to the Minister for Local Government appointing a two-person board of inquiry to formally investigate those allegations. And Nick Street's his name, the minister, he's asked the councillors at Dorset to respond by the end of business today, Friday, the 28th of July, as to why they shouldn't be suspended. Um, and the implication is that he's likely to suspend those councillors next week. Uh, that's pretty big um, for any council, Tony. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 this, of course, is triggered not just by complaints from the public, but, but by apparently by some complaints from some of the councillors themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, things, as you say, like um, mismanagement of conflicts of interest, um, a lack of respect for members of the community, poor decision making and improper use of statutory powers are some of the allegations or complaints, at least, that have been uh, put against um, Dorset Council. And, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see the Minister's response to this show cause, if you like, letter and mm. and, and the material that um, is sent to the Minister and what the Minister decides to do in the weeks ahead. But um, it would seem that, you know, a, a major decision potentially about the, the, the removal of that those councillors is um, on the cards. And interesting timing given the review that's taking place of the sector, forced amalgamations off the table as we've uh, discussed, but a major report coming out in the next uh, couple of months uh, looking at the way forward for a state that's got just 29 councils for, uh, what did we say, about 600,000 people. In the Northern Territory, a serious story here, I do feel for the uh, for the staff and the community at West Arnhem Regional Council, the CEO has been stood down there, in fact, uh, terminated according to media reports. Uh, this has arisen due to allegations that uh, the CEO and a number of staff, senior level as I understand it, uh, took alcohol into a dry community, not for distribution, for personal consumption, but broke the rules, being investigated by Northern Territory uh, police and the council has gotten together in a confidential session and uh, terminated the employment of the CEO. Pretty uh, serious action to take, Tony. Yeah, it is. Um, so we're talking about West Arnhem Regional Council. Mm. And um, look, these, you know, dry laws, if, as they're called, um, are you know, treated very seriously in, in these communities. And of course, you know, if if um, if it was proven that someone in such a responsible role had had um, not abided by these laws, then I can understand um, that would be you know taken quite seriously, and um, and council has um, has acted to remove the CEO um, from his position, um, and no doubt there's there'll be other processes in terms of potentially yeah. criminal criminal matters um or, or not but yeah council has acted swiftly and i think decisively here so the police have said they'll issue eight infringement notices i'm not sure if that's occurred yet uh the inference here and i've had some mail from uh, people who understand the northern territory uh, system a bit better is that um Senior people are in that group. Uh, at least one unconfirmed report has resigned uh, over all of this. Um, I think an interesting clue as to the seriousness of this is that the person who's been put in as the acting CEO for three months has only been at the council for a few months. And this time last year was an executive assistant to a CEO at the city of Palmerston. So nobody in that senior level has been tapped to sit in as acting CEO. It sounds like a crisis to me. It's suggestive of, um, you know, a, a number of those other senior people potentially yeah. being involved, isn't it? But mm. um, yeah, it's uh, I, I, like you, I'm not particularly familiar with um, the implement, you know, how these laws are enforced. Um, but um, yeah, as I say, it seems to be a really decisive message being sent by the council laws at least. It It, it does. All right. Um, the only other thought that um, crosses my mind there is the impact, Julie, on the staff in that organisation. This must be just such a tumultuous time to be trying to get on and do your job. Oh, absolutely, Chris. And, um, you know, they would be concerned about the reputation of the council and all of this mm. and concerned um, 
that you know behavior has not been probably um, at the point in which the the staff would expect from mm. their superior mm. officers. So uh, look, it's really hard to know which way this will go um, in law, but um, but there's a there's a hit and an impact on the council itself mm. and the staff. Uh, the other interstate story that uh, intrigues me is out of Newcastle this week, where it's it's emerged through the media that a serial letter to the editor writer may have very close links with the CEO of Newcastle Council. Um, And there's no denying that the two know each other, but there are denials that there's any connection with the letters that have been uh, sent over a long period of time to the local press. One of the local MPs who's been described as a target of those letters has called for an independent investigation. And it seems the New South Wales local government minister agrees and has called on the mayor of Newcastle to look into this matter. I don't know about you, Julie or Tony. I've been in a situation where you've got a local letter writer and you wonder at times where are they getting their information from? Sometimes, does that person actually exist or is it a nom de plume? I think that's why I find this story so fascinating. It's almost like an episode of Utopia, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> where did they get that information from? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. It's um, all, you know, it, it uh, absolutely, I, I, I can um, empathise with the situation, but it's all very circumstantial at this stage, isn't it? You know, yeah. I happen to, someone happens to know someone who happens to be writing letters. Um, does that mean there's a flow of information that feeds those letters? potentially but not necessarily mm. and so it's where's that evidentiary trail at the moment mm. it's mm. it's it's um circumstantial and and um i guess that's for the investigation if it goes ahead to uncover i, I think i read that the letter writer doesn't actually even live in the city of newcastle but i did read that the ceo has very clearly said he's never asked this person to write letters and the person has said via email to the paper that uh, the ceo has never asked him to write uh, any letters but let's see where that one lands it's time for the picks of the week uh julie what are you going to settle for this week well chris um i'm focusing on the uk again this week and the local government association have come out with a statement that they're quite disappointed um in relation to the legislation around extended producer responsibility for packaging of goods in the UK. So what it is, I think that um, they're trying to decrease the amount of packaging that's used uh, for products, um, particularly fresh food uh, in the UK Mm. because of the waste challenges in the UK that is so, so huge. And a lot of that packaging is actually unrecyclable. So major impact on uh, land uh, landfill. So uh, they've said that apparently the implementation of this has been delayed for yet another 12 months. And they're really disappointed that the fact that it um, hasn't, hasn't come about sooner uh, because uh, another 12 months of councils dealing with this enormous issue of this, um, this packaging around fresh fresh uh, produce. So yeah. a bit of a blow to the sector, Chris. Yes, absolutely. But but it is good to, Julie, have a UK story that you've picked that is not about a council being in financial trouble for a change. <laughs> yes. yes, that's right. I was trying to have a bit of a different spin on this week. Mind I'm... you, there's, there's no shortage of those. There's been more in the past week too. It really is on a precipice. It feels the sector in, uh, in the UK at the moment. Tony, your pick of the week, uh, good old Facebook and uh, the intersection with councillors. Yeah, how many times have we spoken about social media and um, count, council or conduct matters? Um, if I, we had a, only had a penny, as they say, for every time. Mm. But this time we go across the Nullarbor to, to Perth and the cities of uh, city of Bayswater and the town of Cambridge, two municipalities in Perth. Well, they've passed motions this week, both those councils, resolutions requiring that there be kept a register of social media interests of each councillor. So Mm -hmm. councillors must declare if they or their partner manages any community social media. So this is, as you say, the scenario where there's the Facebook community page that um, um, perhaps um, 
unbeknown to others or perhaps not so transparent is that it's being administered or um, managed by a counsellor or their spouse. That allows that, that counsellor potentially to, I guess, um, secretly kind of manipulate some of the stories, um, remove stories that are um, unfavourable to that counsellor, only have stories that favour their position, um, maybe, you know, be promoting stories that are um, that are contrary to um, some group in council, maybe banning people from the, from commenting mm -hmm. um, that they don't agree with. So um, this is all in the interest of transparency. There's not a ban on the councillors um, managing or administering these um, community social media pages, but they need to be transparent and, and include them in this register. Um, my, uh, I think it's a good, good, my thoughts are it's a, it's a good thing um, adding to the transparency for the reasons I've said, but, you know, how do we enforce this? Who's, um, yeah. you know, who, who's the police on the beat here? Um, who's going to, what's going to, who's going to go around and find out um, and what are the implications for failing to um, include this on the register? But I think it's a, you know, I think it's a, an interesting move and one that um, councils are being forced to, to consider in terms of um, the impact of these community Facebook and other social media pages um, that are being sort of controlled by political interests. Yeah, it, curious to me that two councils have done this at the same time. Uh, and they don't appear to have any links, the city of Bayswater and the town of Cambridge, and I wonder whether this is uh, just the start of something, uh, particularly in that Perth local government sector, perhaps one to keep an eye on. Um, I, I wasn't going to do a pick of the week, but I did come across a story just before we uh, came on this morning that I think is worthy of mention. I'll cover this a bit more in the roundup on the weekend. Um, Kiama Municipal Council in uh, New South Wales has voted to support the voice to parliament, um, but one of its councillors voted against that and put out their own press release uh, doing some scaremongering about uh, signage, sort of suggesting that if anybody puts up yes or no signs, that they'd be fined and they'd be in breach of election laws. The mayor of Kayama has had to take the extraordinary step of putting out a statement to say this councillor does not speak for the council, he's not authorised, and, and he's also wrong that uh, referendum advertising and signage is not covered by normal election signage and tried to hose down that situation. So in light of that arbiter's decision about media policy, et cetera, that we were talking about earlier, there's perhaps a bit of a case study building there in Kiama that people might want to have a look at. All right, uh, Tony, Julie, I think we've reached the end of another bumper issue. And uh, I want to thank you both again for your, uh, for your insights and uh, being part of TGU. Well, Thanks very much. It's a Chris. pleasure. And I will just plug again that there is a special edition of VLGA Connect coming next week where we will unpack in great detail the implications of the Operation Sandon report for the local government sector. Keep an eye on your social media feeds for news of that episode. I think it'll be around Monday night, maybe Tuesday, that we might be able to get that uh, to you. In the meantime, thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you again very soon for more from VLGA Connect. Mm -hmm.